in our culture with tremendous uh, technical and cultural change, lifestyle change, we tend to pay a little bit less attention to that because our elders, we think, oh, they, they don't know stuff that's important. They don't really know the latest bands or they don't know whatever the football scores or whatever, basketball scores or whatever that younger people might think is important. Well, of course, I don't think that's the case at all, beginning to enter the elder category myself. And what we have today is a really, really extraordinary person that is coming to you with an extraordinary message. Dr. Albert Bartlett was born in Ohio. He worked on a uh, ore freighter in the Great Lakes. He went to Colgate, where I often also went, graduated uh, with distinction in physics in 1944, his first job. Did you hitchhike? He got on. Did you hitchhike or take a train? I hitchhiked. He hitchhiked to Los Alamos, where he worked on the Manhattan Project. Now, you guys might be freaked out about the Manhattan Project. My father was fighting in Okinawa, I believe, the Manhattan Project after Okinawa, which was horrible, fierce for both sides. My father was preparing to invade Japan. He did not because of the atomic bomb, which I believe saved the lives of millions and millions of especially Japanese kids. We can discuss that at some other time. Dr. Bartlett went to Los Alamos with most of the other bright young physicists in the United States, worked on that Manhattan Project. He has had lunch with Niels Bohr. He has attended lectures given by Robert Oppenheimer. He is an incredible link to an incredible past of science. This was when science really came into the fore, was in issues around World War II with things like radar and sonar, and ultimately the atomic bomb that ended the war like that and saved millions and millions of lives, if you want to look at it that way. Now, Dr. Bartlett has been professor of physics at the University of Colorado since 1950. Since his retirement, he has been on a mission. You are lucky to hear his mission and he'll explain it to you. I don't need to, but I think it's quite extraordinary. Welcome him. He comes to this, I guess this is about your eighth time to ESF. He knows you are a very, very special audience for his message, and please welcome Dr. Albert Bartlett. Thank you, Charlie. Well, it's a real pleasure to be here. And I want to share with you some very simple ideas about the problems we're facing. Now, some of these problems are local, some are national, some are global. They're all tied together. They're tied together with arithmetic, and the arithmetic is very difficult. And what I hope to do is I hope to be able to convince you that the greatest shortcoming of the human race is our inability to understand the exponential function. Well, you say, what's the exponential function? This is the mathematical function that you write down if you're going to describe the size of anything that was growing steadily. If you had something growing 5% per year, you'd write the exponential function to show how large that growing quantity was year after year. So we're talking about a situation where the time that's required for the growing quantity to increase by a fixed fraction is a constant. 5% per year, the 5% is a fixed fraction, so per year is a fixed length of time. That's what we want to talk about, ordinary steady growth. Well, if it takes a fixed length of time to grow 5%, it follows it takes a longer fixed length of time to grow 100%. Now, the longer time is called the doubling time. We need to know how you calculate the doubling time. It's easy. You just take the number 70, divide it by the percent growth per unit time, and that gives you the doubling time. Our example of 5% per year, you divide the 5 into 70, you find that growing quantity will double in size every 14 years. You might ask, where did the 70 come from? The answer is it's approximately 100 multiplied by the natural logarithm of 2. If you wanted the time to triple, you'd use the natural logarithm of 3. So it's all very logical, but you don't have to remember where it came from. Just remember 70. Now, I wish we could get every person to make this mental calculation every time we see a percent growth rate of anything in a news story. 
For example, if you saw a story that said things have been growing 7% per year for several recent years, you wouldn't bat an eyelash. But when you see a headline that says crime has doubled in a decade, you say, my heavens, what's happening? Well, what is happening? 7% growth per year. Divide the 7 into 70, the doubling time is 10 years. But notice, if you're going to write a headline, you'd never write crime growing 7% per year. Nobody would know what it really means. Do you know what 7% really means? Let's take another example from Colorado. The cost of an all-day lift ticket to ski at Vail has been growing about 7% per year ever since Vail first opened in 1963. And at that time, you paid $5 for an all-day lift ticket. Now, what's the doubling time for 7% growth? 10 years. So what was the price 10 years later in 1973? And 10 years later in 1983. And 10 years later in 1993. And what do we have to look forward to? <laughs> this is what 7% means. Most people don't have a clue. Well, let's look at a generic graph of something that's growing steadily. After one doubling time, the growing quantity is up to twice its initial size. Two doubling times, it's up to four times its initial size. Then it goes to 8, 16, 32, 64, 128, 256, 5, 12, and just 10 doubling times. It's a thousand times larger than when it started. You can see if you try to make a graph of that on ordinary graph paper, the graph's going to go right through the ceiling. Now let me give you an example to show the enormous numbers you can get with just a modest number of doublings. Legend has it that the game of chess was invented by a mathematician who worked for a king. The king was very pleased. He said, I want to reward you. The mathematician said, my needs are modest. Please take my new chess board and on the first square place one grain of wheat. On the next square double a one to make two. On the next square double a two to make four. Just keep doubling till you double for every square. That will be an adequate payment. Well, we can guess that the king thought this foolish man. I was ready to give him a real reward. All he asked for is just a few grains of wheat. Let's see what's involved in this. We note there are eight grains on the fourth square. Now I can get this number eight by multiplying three twos together. It's two times two times two. It's one two less than the number of the square. Now that continues in each case. So on the last square, I find the number of grains by multiplying 63 twos together. Now let's look at the way the totals build up. When we have one grain on the first square, the total on the board is one. We add two grains, that makes a total three. We put on four grains, now the total is seven. Seven is a grain less than eight. It's a grain less than three twos multiplied together. Fifteen is a grain less than four twos multiplied together. That continues in each case. So when we're done, the total number of grains will be one grain less than the number I get multiplying 64 twos together. And my question is, how much wheat is that? You know, would that be a nice pile here in the room? Would it fill the building? Would it cover the county to a depth of two meters? How much wheat are we talking about? Well, the answer is it's roughly 400 times the 1990 worldwide harvest of wheat. <laughs> now, that could be more wheat than humans have harvested in the entire history of the earth. You say, how did you get such a big number? It was simple. We just started with one grain, but we let the number grow steadily to let it double a mere 63 times. Now there's something else that's very important. The growth in any doubling time is greater than the total of all of the preceding growth. For example, when we put eight grains on the fourth square, the eight is larger than the total of seven that were already on the board. When we put 32 grains on the sixth square, the 32 is larger than the total of 31 that were already there. Every time the growing quantity doubles, it takes more than was required in all of the preceding growth. Well, let's translate that into the energy crisis. Here's an ad from the year 1975. It asked the question, could America run out of electricity? America depends on electricity. Our need for electricity actually doubles every 10 or 12 years. Now that's a very, an accurate reflection of a very long history of steady growth of the electric industry in the United States. Growth at a rate of around 7% per year, which gives you doubling every 10 years. Now with all that history of growth, they just expected the growth to go on forever. Now fortunately it stopped. Not because anyone understood arithmetic, it stopped for other reasons, but let's ask what if. Suppose the growth had continued then we would see here the thing we just saw on the chessboard in the 10 years following the appearance of this ad in that decade 
the amount of electrical energy we would have consumed in this country would have been greater than the total of all of the electrical energy we had ever consumed in the entire preceding history of the steady growth of that industry in this country. Now, did you realize that anything is completely acceptable? A 7% growth per year could give such an incredible consequence that in just 10 years you'd use more than the total of all that have been used in all the preceding growth. Well, that's exactly what President Carter was referring to in his famous speech on energy. One of his statements was this. He said, and in each of those decades, more oil was consumed than in all of mankind's previous history. By itself, that's a stunning statement. But now you can understand it. The president was telling us a simple consequence of the arithmetic of 7% growth each year in world oil production, and that was a historic figure up until the 1970s. Now there's another beautiful consequence of this arithmetic. If you take 70 years as a period of time, and note that that's roughly one human lifetime, then any percent growth continued steadily for 70 years give you an overall increase by a factor that's very easy to calculate. For example, 4% per year for 70 years, you find the factor by multiplying four twos together, it's a factor of 16. Now a few years ago, one of the newspapers in Boulder, Colorado, quizzed the nine <coughs> members of our city council and asked them, what rate of growth of Boulder's population do you think it would be good to have in the coming years? Well, the nine members of the Boulder City Council gave answers ranging from a low of 1% per year now that happens to match the present rate of growth of the population of the United States. We are not at zero population growth. Right now, the number of Americans increases every year by over three million people. Now no member of the city council said Boulder should grow less rapidly than the United States is growing. Now the highest answer any council member gave was 5% per year. You know, I felt compelled. I had to write him a letter and say, did you know? that 5% per year for just 70 years, and I can remember when 70 years used to seem like an awful long time. It just doesn't seem so long now. Well, that means Boulder's population would increase by a factor of 32. That is where today we have one overloaded sewer treatment plant in 70 years, we need 32 overloaded sewer treatment plants. Now, did you realize that anything is completely all-American? This 5% growth per year could give such an incredible consequence in such a modest period of time. Our city council people had zero understanding of this very simple arithmetic. <clears throat> well, a few years ago, I had a class of non-science students. We were interested in problems of science and society. We spent a lot of time learning to use semi-logarithmic graph paper, which is printed in such a way that these equal intervals along the vertical scale each represent an increase by a factor of 10. So you go from 1,000 to 10,000 to 100,000. And the reason you use this special paper is that on this paper, a straight line represents steady growth. We worked a lot of examples. I said to the students, let's talk about inflation. Let's talk about 7% per year. Now, it wasn't this high when we did this. It's been higher since then, and fortunately, it's lower now. And I said to the students, as I can say to you, you have roughly 60 years life expectancy ahead of you. Let's see what some common things will cost if we have 60 years of 7% annual inflation. Well, the students found that a 55 cent gallon of gasoline will cost $35.20. 250 for a movie will be $160. <laughs> The $15 sack of groceries that my mother used to buy for a dollar and a quarter, that'll be $960. $100 suit of clothes, $6,400. A $4,000 automobile will cost a quarter of a million dollars, and a $45,000 home will cost almost $3 million. Well, I gave the students these data. These came from a Blue Cross Blue Shield ad. The ad appeared in Newsweek magazine, and the ad gave these figures to show the cost escalation of gallbladder surgery. In the year since 1950, when that surgery cost $361, and I said, make a semi-logarithmic plot, let's see what's happening. The students found that the first four points lined up on a straight line indicating inflation of about 6% per year, but the fourth, fifth, and sixth were on a steeper line, almost 10% inflation per year. Well, then I said to the students, run that steeper line on out to the year, year 2000. That's two years ago. Let's get an idea what gallbladder surgery might cost. And the answer is $25,000. The lesson there is awfully clear. If you're thinking about gallbladder surgery, do it now. <laughs> 
In the summer of 1986, the news reports indicated that the world population had reached a number 5 billion people, growing at the rate of 1.7 percent per year. Well, your reaction to 1.7 might be to say, that's so small. Nothing bad could ever happen at 1.7 percent per year. So you calculate the doubling time, you find it's only 41 years. Now that was back in 1986. More recently, you noted that in 1999, the world population had increased from 5 billion to 6 billion people. The good news is that the growth rate had dropped from 1.7 to 1.3 percent. The bad news is that in spite of the drop of the growth rate, the world population today is increasing by about 80 million people every year. Now, if you enjoy doing arithmetic, you can calculate that if this modest 1.3 percent per year continued unchanged in the future, the world population would grow to a density of one person per square meter on the dry land surface of the earth in just 780 years, and the mass of people would equal the mass of the earth in just 2,400 years. Now we can smile at those. We know they couldn't happen. This one makes for a cute cartoon. The caption says, excuse me, sir, but I am prepared to make you a rather attractive offer for your square. <laughs> now, there's a very profound lesson in that cartoon. The lesson is that zero population growth is going to happen. Now, we can debate whether we like zero population growth or don't like it. It's going to happen whether we debate it or not, whether we like it or not. It's absolutely certain. People couldn't live at that density on the dry land surface of the earth. Therefore, today's high birth rates will drop, today's low death rates will rise till they have exactly the same numerical value that will certainly be in a time short compared to 780 years. So maybe you're wondering, well, what options are available if we wanted to address the problem? In the left-hand column, I've listed some of those things that we should encourage if we want to raise the rate of growth of population and in so doing make the problem worse. Just look at the list. Everything in the list is as sacred as motherhood. There's immigration, medicine, public health, sanitation. Now these are all devoted to the humane goals of lowering the death rate. And that's very important to me if it's my death they're lowering. <laughs> then I've got to realize that anything that just lowers the death rate makes the population problem worse. There's peace, law and order. Scientific agriculture has lowered the death rate due to famine. That just makes the population problem worse. The 55 mile an hour speed limit saved thousands of lives. <laughs> that makes the population problem worse. Clean air makes it worse. Now in this column are some of the things we should encourage if we want to lower the rate of growth of population and in so doing help solve the population problem. Well, there's abstention, contraception, abortion, small family, stop immigration, disease, war, murder, famine, accidents, Smoking clearly raises the death rate. Now that helps solve the problem. <laughs> well, remember our conclusion from the cartoon of one person per square meter, we concluded that zero population growth is going to happen. But we can state that conclusion in other terms and say it's obvious nature is going to choose from the right hand list and we don't have to do anything except be prepared to live with whatever nature chooses from that right hand list or we can exercise the one option that's open to us. And that option is to choose first from the right-hand list. We've got to find something here we can go out and campaign for. <laughs> Anyone here for promoting disease? We now have the capability of incredible war. Would you like more murder, more famine, more accidents? Well, here we can see the critical problem that's facing the human race. Because everything we regard as good makes the population problem worse. Everything we regard as bad helps solve the problem. <coughs> now there is a dilemma if ever there was one. And the one remaining question is education. Does it go in the left-hand <laughs> column or the right-hand <laughs> column? Well, I have to say thus far it's been firmly in the left-hand <laughs> column. And I've done anything about reducing ignorance of the problem. <coughs> Nature is already making the choice. I have a friend that came back from Zimbabwe. The AIDS epidemic is devastating the continent of Africa. He says people are dying on the streets. Nature is choosing from the right-hand list. So where do we start? Well, let's start in Boulder, Colorado. There's the graph of Boulder's population. There's the 1950 census figure, 1960-1970. That section there of 20 years, the average growth rate of population was 6% per year. Now, with big efforts, we've been able to slow it. 
Here's the 2000 census figure, and I like to ask people, let's go another lifetime, 70 years, and ask what rate of growth of Boulder's population would we need in the coming 70 years so that at the end of 70 years, Boulder's population would equal today's population of your choice of major American cities. Boulder in 70 years could be as big as Boston is today if we just grew 2.6% per year. Now if we thought Detroit was a better model, we'll have to shoot for 3.25% per year. And remember the historic figure on the preceding slide, 6% <coughs> per year. If that could continue for one lifetime, the population of Boulder would be greater than the population of Los Angeles. Well, I'll tell you, you couldn't put Los Angeles in the Boulder Valley. Therefore, it's obvious Boulder's population is going to stop. And the only question is, will we be able to stop it while there's still some open space, or will we wait until it's wall-to-wall -wall people and we're all choking to death? Well, every once in a while somebody says to me, but you know, a bigger city might be a better city. And I have to say, wait a minute, that experiment's been done. We don't need to wonder what will be the effect of growth on Boulder because Boulder tomorrow can be seen in Los Angeles today. And for the price of an airplane ticket, we can step 70 years into the future and see exactly what it's like. And what is it like? Well, here's an interesting headline from Los Angeles. <coughs> <laughs> now that has probably something to do with this headline from Los Angeles. And so how are we doing in Colorado? We're the growth capital of the USA and proud of it. The Denver and Rocky Mountain News tells us to expect another million people in the Front Range area in the next 20 years. And there was a rather perceptive observation in the Denver Post. Somebody said Colorado has a 3% growth rate. That's like a third world country with no birth control. <laughs> the United States sends family planning assistance to developing nations that have smaller population growth rates than Colorado has. Well, as you can imagine, growth control is very controversial. And I treasure the letter from which these quotations are taken. Now this letter was written to me by a leading citizen of our community. He's a leading proponent of controlled growth. Now controlled growth just means growth. This man writes, I take no exception to your arguments regarding exponential growth. I don't believe the exponential argument is valid at the local level. <laughs> so you see arithmetic doesn't hold in Boulder. <laughs> <laughs> now I have to admit, that man has a degree from the University of Colorado. <laughs> it's not a degree in mathematics and science or in engineering. Let's look now at what happens when we have this kind of steady growth in a finite environment. Bacteria grow by doubling, and one bacterium divides to become two, the two divide to become four, the four become eight, sixteen, and so on. Suppose we had bacteria that doubled in number this way every minute, Suppose we put one of these bacteria in an empty bottle at 11 in the morning and then observe that the bottle's full at 12 noon. Now there's our case of ordinary steady growth. It has a doubling time of one minute. It's in the finite environment of one bottle. I want to ask you three questions. Number one, at what time was the bottle half full? 11.59. 11.59, because they double in number every minute. This is the characteristic of steady growth. This is the central characteristic of the entire global economy. Second question, if you were an average bacterium in that bottle, at what time would you first realize you were running out of space? Well, let's look at the last minutes in the bottle. At 12 noon it's full, one minute before it's half full, two minutes before it's a quarter full, then an eighth and a sixteenth. Let me ask you, at five minutes before 12, when the bottle is only 3.1% full and it's 97% open space, just yearning for development, how many of you would realize there was a problem? Now in the ongoing controversy over growth in Boulder, someone wrote to the newspaper some years ago and said, look, there's no problem with population growth in Boulder because, the writer said, we have 15 times as much open space as we've already used. So let me ask you, what time was it in Boulder when the open space was 15 times the amount of space we'd already used? And the answer is it was four minutes before 12 in Boulder Valley. 
Suppose that at two minutes before 12, some of the bacteria realize they're running out of space, so they launch a great search for new bottles. <laughs> they search offshore and on the outer continental shelf, in the overthrust belt, and in the Arctic, they find three new bottles. Now, that is a colossal discovery. That discovery is three times the amount of resource they ever knew about before. They now have four bottles. Before the discovery, there's only one. Surely, this will give them a sustainable society, won't it? Well, you know what the third question is. How long can the growth continue as a result of this magnificent discovery? Well, look at the score. At 12 noon, one bottle's filled, there are three to go. 1201, two bottles are filled, there are two to go. And at 1202, all four are filled. That's the end of the line. Now, you don't need any more arithmetic than this to evaluate the absolutely contradictory statements that we've all heard and read from experts who tell us in one breath we can go on increasing our rates of consumption of fossil fuels. In the next breath they say, but don't worry, we'll always be able to make the discoveries of new resources that we need to meet the requirements of that growth. Well, some years ago in Washington, our energy secretary observed that in the energy crisis, we have a classic case of exponential growth against a finite source. So let's look at some of these finite sources. In the work of the late Dr. M. King Hubbard, we have here a semi-logarithmic plot of world oil production. The line's been approximately straight for over 100 years, clear up here to 1970. Average growth rate very close to 7% per year. And so it's logical to ask, well, how much longer could that 7% continue? Well, that's answered by the numbers in this table. In the top line, the numbers tell us that in the year 1973, the world oil production was 20 billion barrels. Total production in all of history, including the 20, was 300 billion. The remaining oil reserves, 1,700 billion. Now, those are data. The rest of this table is just calculated out. Assume the annual production increases 7% per year. In the years following 1973, exactly as it had been for the preceding 100 years. Now, in fact, the growth stopped. It stopped because OPEC raised their oil prices. So we're asking, what if? Suppose the growth had continued. Well, let's go back to 1981. By 1981, on the 7% curve, the total usage in all of history would add up to 500 billion barrels, the remaining reserves 1,500 billion. The reserves at that point are three times the total of all that have been used in all of history. That is an enormous reserve. But what time is it when the remaining reserve is three times the total of all you've used in all of history? And the answer is two minutes before 12. Well, we know for 7% growth, the doubling time is 10 years. So we go from 1981 to 1991. By 1991, on the 7% curve, the total usage in all of history would add up to 1,000 billion barrels. There'd be 1,000 billion left. Now, at that point, the remaining oil would be equal in quantity to the total of everything we had used in something like 130 years of the oil industry on this earth. By most measures, you'd say that is an enormous remaining reserve. But what time is it when the remaining reserve is equal to all you've used in all of history? And the answer is it's one minute before 12. And so we go one more decade to the turn of the century like right now, and that's when 7% would finish using up the oil reserves of the earth. Well, we can see this in a very nice graphical way. Suppose the area of that tiny rectangle represents all the oil we used before 1940. Then in the decade of the 40s, we used this much. That's equal to all that have been used in all of history. In the decade of the 50s, we used this much. That's equal to all that have been used in all of history. In the decade of the 60s, we used this much. Again, that's equal to the total of all the previous usage. And if that 7% <coughs> has continued through the 70s, 80s, and 90s, there's what we need. But that's all the oil there is. <coughs> Now, there's a widely held belief that if you throw enough money at holes in the ground, oil is sure to come out. There will be discoveries in new oil. There may be major discoveries, but look, we've got to discover this much new oil if we would have that 7% growth continue another 10 years. Ask yourself, what do you think is the chance that oil discovered after the close of our class today will be in an amount equal to the total of all we've known about in all of history. And then realize if all that new oil could be discovered, that would let the 7% growth continue 10 more years. Well, it's interesting to read what the experts say. In an interview in Time Magazine, we read from one of the most widely quoted oil experts in all of Texas, 
They asked him, but haven't many of our bigger fields been drilled nearly dry? And he responds saying there's still as much oil to be found in the U.S. as has ever been produced. Let's assume he's right. What time is it? One minute before 12. I've read several things this guy's written. I don't think he has any understanding of this very simple arithmetic. <coughs> well, in the crisis, about 20 years ago, I had such as this appeared. It was from the American Electric Power Company. It was a bit reassuring, so I'm just saying, now don't worry too much, because we're sitting on half of the world's known supply of coal, enough for over 500 years. Well, where did that 500-year figure come from? It may have had its origin in this report to the Committee on Interior and Insular Affairs of the United States Senate, because in that report we find this sentence. At current levels of output and recovery, these American coal reserves can be expected to last more than 500 <coughs> years. Now there is one of the most dangerous statements in the literature. It's dangerous because it's true. But it isn't the truth that makes it dangerous. The danger lies in the fact that people take the sentence apart. They just say coal will last 500 years. They forget the caveat with which the sentence started. Now what were those opening words? At current levels. Now what does that mean? It means if and only if we maintain zero growth of coal production in the United States. So let's look at a few numbers. We go to the annual energy review from the Department of Energy. They give this figure as the coal reserve base in the U.S. and it carries a footnote that about half the demonstrated reserve base is estimated to be recoverable. You cannot recover and use 100% of the coal that's in the ground. So this number is half of this, and we'll come back to those in just a moment. Now the report also tells us that in 1971 we were mining coal at this rate, 20 years later at this rate. Put those numbers together, the average growth rate of coal production in that 20-year period was 2.86% per year. And so we have to ask, how long could a resource last if you had steady growth in the rate of consumption till the last bit of it was used? Well, I'll just show you that equation for the expiration time. I'll tell you it takes first-year college calculus to derive that equation, so it can't be very difficult. You know, I have the feeling there must be dozens of people in this country who have had first-year college calculus. <laughs> but let me suggest I think that equation is probably the best-kept scientific secret of the century. Now let me show you why. If you use that equation to calculate the life expectancy of the reserve base, or the one half they can recover for different rates of growth, you find if the growth rate is zero, the small estimate would go about 240 years, the large one would go close to 500 years. So that report to the Congress was correct. But look what we get if we plug in steady growth. Back in the 1960s, it was our national goal to achieve growth of around 8% per year in U.S. coal production. If that could be achieved and continued, coal would run out between 37 and 46 years. President Carter cut that goal in half, hoping to reach 4% per year. In fact, the continued coal would last between 59 and 75 years. Here's that 2.86, the average for a recent 20-year period. If that would continue, coal would last between 72 and 94 years. That's within the life expectancy of children born today. The only way you're going to get anywhere near this widely quoted 500-year figure is to do simultaneously two highly improbable things. Number one, you've got to figure out how to use 100% of the coal that's in the ground. Number two, you've got to figure out how to have 500 years of zero growth of coal production. These are simple facts. Now back in the 1970s, there was great national concern about energy, but this concern disappeared in the 80s. Now the concerns about energy in the 70s prompted experts, journalists, and scientists to assure the American people that there was no reason to be concerned. So let's go back now and look at some of those assurances from the 70s so we can see what to expect when the energy crisis returns. Here's the director of the Energy Division of the Oak Ridge National Laboratory telling us how expensive it is to import oil, telling us we must have big increases in our use of coal. Under these conditions, he estimates America's coal reserves are so huge they can last a minimum of 300 years, probably a maximum of 1,000 years. You've just seen the facts. Now you see what an expert tells us and what can you conclude. There was a three-hour television special on CBS on energy. The reporter said by the lowest estimate we have enough coal for 200 years, but the highest enough for more than 1,000 years. You've just seen the facts. 
Now you see what a journalist tells us after careful study. And what can you conclude? In the Journal of Chemical Education, on the page for high school chemistry teachers, an article by the scientific staff of the journal, they tell us our proof coal reserves are enormous, they give a figure. These could satisfy present U.S. energy needs for nearly a thousand years. Let's do long division. You take the coal they say is there, divide by what was then the current rate of consumption, you get 180 years. Now they didn't say current rate of consumption, they said present U.S. energy needs. Coal today supplies about one-fifth, around 20% of the energy we use in this country. So if you'd like to calculate how long this quantity of coal could satisfy present U.S. energy needs, you have to multiply the denominator by five. When you do that, you get 36 years. They said nearly a thousand years. Newsweek magazine in a cover story on energy said at present rates of consumption, we have enough coal for 666.5 years, and the point five means they think it'll run out in July instead of January. <laughs> <coughs> if you round that off and say, you know, roughly 600 years, that's close enough to 500 to lie within the uncertainty of our knowledge of the size of the resource. So with that observation, that's a correct statement. But what this led into was a big major story about how we have to have rapid growth in coal consumption. Well, it's obvious, isn't it? that if you have the rapid growth, it won't last as long as they said it would last with zero growth. They never mentioned this. I wrote them a long letter, told them I thought this was a serious misrepresentation to give the readers the feeling we can have all the growth they're writing about and still have coal around for 600 years. I got back a nice form letter. It had nothing to do with what I tried to explain to them. I gave this talk at a high school in Omaha, and after the talk, the high school physics teacher came to me, and he had a booklet. He said, have you seen this? I hadn't seen it. He said, look at this, we've got coal coming out of our ears. <laughs> As reported by Forbes magazine. Now that's a prominent business magazine. The United States has 437 billion tons of coal reserves. That's a good number. This is equivalent to a lot of BTUs or enough energy to keep 100 million large electric generating plants going for the next 800 years or so. Well, the teacher said to me, how can that be true? That's one large electric generating plant for every two people in the United States. I said, of course it can't be true. It's absolute nonsense. Let's do long division to see how crazy it is. So you take the coal they say is there, divide by what was then the current rate of consumption. You couldn't keep that current rate up for 800 years. We hardly have 500 large electric plants. They said it would be good for 100 million such plants. Time Magazine tells us that beneath the pitheads of Appalachia, in the Ohio Valley, and under the sprawling strip mines of the West, lie coal seams rich enough to meet the country's power needs for centuries, no matter how much energy consumption may grow. And so I give you a very fundamental observation. Don't believe any projection of the life expectancy of a non-renewable resource until you have confirmed the prediction by repeating the calculation. As a corollary, we have to note that the more optimistic the prediction, the greater is the probability that it's based on faulty arithmetic or on no arithmetic at all. Again, from Time Magazine, energy industries agree that to achieve some form of energy self-sufficiency, the U.S. must mine all the coal that it can. Well, think about that for just a moment. Let me paraphrase it. The more rapidly we consume our resources, the more self-sufficient we'll be. Now, isn't that what that says? David Brower called this the policy of strength through exhaustion. Now, here's an example of strength through exhaustion. Here is William Simon, energy advisor to the President of the United States. And Simon says we should be trying to get as many holes drilled as possible to get the proven oil reserves. The more rapidly we can get the last of that oil up out of the ground, finish using it, the better off we'll be. <laughs> well, let's look at Dr. Hubbard's graph of petroleum <coughs> production in the lower 48. This is a semi-logarithmic graph, approximately straight line, but for some time now, production's fallen below the growth curve, while our demand continued on up this growth curve until the 1970s. Now, it's obvious the difference between the two curves has to be made up with imports, and it was in early 1995 that we read that the year 1994 was the first year in our nation's history in which we had to import more oil than we were able to get out of our own ground ourselves. Now, maybe you're wondering, does it make any sense to imagine that we can have steady growth in the rate of consumption of a resource until the last bit of it was used, and then the rate would plunge abruptly to zero? 
I say, no, that does not make sense. You say, okay, why bother us with the calculation of this expiration time? Well, my answer is this. Every segment of our society, our business leaders, government leaders, political leaders, industrial leaders, the local level, state level, national level, everyone aspires to maintain a society in which all measures of material consumption continue to grow steadily year after year after year, world without end. Now, since that's so central to everything we do, we ought to know where it would lead. On the other hand, we should note there's a better model. And this comes again from the work of the late Dr. Hubbard. He's plotted the rate of consumption of resources that have already expired. He finds, yes, there is an early period of steady growth in the rate of consumption, but then the rate goes to a maximum and comes back down in a nice symmetric bell-shaped curve. Now, when he did this some years ago and fitted it to the curve on U.S. oil production, he found at that time we were right there. We were right at the peak. We were halfway through the oil. There was as much left to, to discover and use as total of all we'd consume. That's roughly what that Texas expert said. Now let's see what it means. It means that from now on domestic oil production can only go downhill and it's downhill all the rest of the way. And it doesn't matter what they say inside the Beltway in Washington, D.C. Now it means we can work hard and put some bumps on the downhill side of the curve. You'll see there are bumps on the uphill side. The debate is heating up over drilling in the Arctic Wildlife Refuge. I've seen the estimate that they might fine, 3.2 billion barrels of oil up there. That's the area of this little tiny square. That's less than one year's consumption in the U.S. And let's look at the curve in this way. The area under the entire curve represents all the oil that was ever in our ground. That's been divided here into three parts. Unshaded on the left is the oil we've taken from the ground. We've used it. It's gone. This vertical shaded band, that's the oil we've drilled into. We found it. We're pumping on it today. Shaded in green on the right is the undiscovered oil. We have very good ways now of estimating how much oil remains undiscovered. This is the oil we're looking for in all the places where drilling is going on. This is the oil we've got to find if we're going to make it down the curve on schedule. Now every once in a while somebody said, well, you know, a hundred years ago somebody did a calculation and said that the U.S. would be out of oil in 25 years. We obviously were not. The calculation must have been wrong. Therefore, of course, all calculations are wrong. Let's understand what they did then. A hundred years ago, this band of discovered oil was over in here somewhere. All they did was take the discovered oil. They had no idea then how much was undiscovered. Take the discovered, divide by how rapidly it was then being used, and come up with 25 years. It's obvious you've got to make a new calculation every time you make a new discovery. We're not asking today, how long will the discovered oil last? We're asking about the discovered and the undiscovered. We're now asking about the rest of the oil. And what does the geological survey tell us? Well, in 1984, they said the estimated U.S. supply from undiscovered resources and demonstrated reserves 36 years at present rates of production or 19 years in the absence of imports. Five years later, in 1989, the 36 years was down to 32 years, the 19 years was down to 16 years, so the numbers are holding together as we march down the right-hand side of that Hubbard curve. Well, Dr. Hubbard addressed a convention of petroleum geologists and engineers back in 1956, and he told them, that the calculations he had done led him to conclude that the peaks that you just saw of U.S. oil and gas production could be expected to occur between 1966 and 1971. Well, no one took him seriously. So let's see what's happened. The data here are from the Department of Energy. You see a long period of steady growth. Here's 1956 when Dr. Hubbard did his analysis. At that time, he said the peak would occur between 1966 and 1971. There's the peak, it was in 1970, it was followed by a very rapid decline. Then the Alaska pipeline started delivering oil and there was a partial recovery. That production has now peaked and everything's going downhill in unison on the right hand side of the curve and when I use a spreadsheet on my computer at home to estimate the parameters of the curve that's the best fit to these scattered data, I find from that best fit curve it looks to me as though we have consumed three quarters of the recoverable oil that was ever in our ground and we are now coasting downhill in the last 25% of that once enormous resource. And so we have to ask, well, what does this mean? Well, let's look at the definition of modern agriculture. It's the use of land to convert petroleum into food. And we can see the end of the petroleum. Well, we have to ask about world oil. 
here is Dr. Hubbard's graph from 1972, and at that time he predicted that the world peak would occur about 1995. So let's see what's happened. Here are the data, and what we see is a long period of steady growth. There was quite a large drop there, and then there was a recovery, then there was an enormous drop, and a very slow recovery. Well, it's clear we're not yet over the peak. So I go back to my spreadsheet to do the curve fitting, and now I have to add one more input to the calculation. I have to ask, what is the total amount of oil that geologists think we will ever find on this earth? The consensus figure is around 2,000 billion barrels. Now that's very uncertain, plus or minus 40 percent. So if I plug in 2,000 billion and do the fit, this is the curve that results. It peaks two years from now. If I assume there's 50 percent more oil than the geologists say, <coughs> then I get a peak in the year 2019. If I assume <coughs> there's twice the oil the geologists say, then the peak's in 2030. So no matter how you cut it, in your life expectancy, you're going to see the peak of world oil production. You've got to ask yourself, what is life going to be like when we're going down the right-hand side of that Hubbard curve and we've got a growing population and we've got a growing per capita demand for oil? Now, there were, in the Scientific American for March of 1998, there was a major article by two global petroleum geologists. They said this peak would occur before 2010. So we're in the same ballpark. Now that article in Scientific American triggered a lot of discussion. And in Fortune magazine, commenting on this scientific analysis, we read that a professor of economics at MIT said this analysis is a piece of foolishness. The world will never run out of oil, not in 10,000 years. <laughs> so we have non-scientists telling us that petroleum reserves are greater than ever before in history. We have geologists telling us that we're finding one new barrel of oil for every four barrels we take from the ground. So we have to ask, what is going on here? <coughs> On the front page of the Wall Street Journal, we read about the new discovery of the Hibernia oil field off the south coast of Newfoundland. And please note this one line in the headline, now it will last 50 years. Let's read about the Hibernia field. The Wall Street Journal tells us that it's the largest oil discovery in North America in decades, should deliver its first oil by the end of the year. At least 20 more fields may follow, offering well over a billion barrels of high-quality crude, promising a steady flow of oil just a quick tanker run away from the energy-thirsty East Coast. They may find a billion barrels. We're now consuming 18 million barrels every day. Do the long division, you find that discovery, if it turns out as they expect, would last 56 days. And what did that headline say? Said it would last 50 years. Well, <clears throat> Dr. Hubbard testified before a committee of the Congress. He told them that the exponential phase of the industrial growth, which has dominated human activities during the last couple of centuries, is now drawing to a close. Yet during the last two centuries of unbroken industrial growth, we have evolved what amounts to an exponential growth culture. I would say it's more than a culture, it's our national religion. We worship growth. Listen to the politicians in Washington tell how we're going to grow our way out of this problem or that problem. Pick up any newspaper. You'll see headlines such as this, state forecast robust growth. Have you ever heard of a physician diagnosing a cancer in a patient and telling the patient you have a robust cancer? <laughs> we had Americans being killed in the Gulf War and what's this person worried about? He doesn't care about people, about people being killed. All he worries about is, oh my, the Gulf War may hurt growth in Colorado. And it isn't just in the United States that we have this affliction. The Japanese are so accustomed to growth that economists in Tokyo usually speak of a recession as any time the growth rate dips below 3% per year. So what do we do? Well, in the words of Winston Churchill, sometimes we have to do what is required. We have to educate all of our people to an understanding of the arithmetic and the consequences of growth, especially in terms of resources and in terms of populations. We have to educate people to recognize the fact that growth of populations and growth of rates of consumption of resources cannot be sustained. We have to educate people to see the need to examine carefully the allegations of the technological optimists who assure us that science and technology will take care of all these problems. 
Now, chief among these optimists was the late Dr. Julian Simon. He was a professor of economics and business administration at the University of Illinois, later at the University of Maryland. With regard to copper, Simon has written that we will never run out of copper because copper can be made from other metals. <laughs> now the letters to the editor jumped all over him, told him about chemistry, and he just brushed it off. Don't worry, he said, if it's ever important, we'll figure out how to make copper out of other metals. <laughs> now Simon had a book that was published by the Princeton University Press, and in that book, he's writing about oil from many sources, including biomass, and he says, clearly, there's no meaningful limit to this source except for the sun's energy. He goes on to note, but even if our sun were not so vast as it is, there may well be other suns elsewhere. <laughs> Simon's right. There are other suns elsewhere. But the question is, would you base public policy on the belief that if we need another sun, we'll figure out how to go get it and haul it into the solar system. <laughs> now don't laugh. For decades before his death, this man was a trusted policy advisor at the very highest levels in Washington, D.C. That was your first reading in this class, remember? That one page thing from the sun. Well, <clears throat> Isaac Asimov was interviewed by Bill Moyers, and Moyers asked him what happens to the idea of the dignity of the human species if this population growth continues, and Asimov says it'll be completely destroyed. I like to use what I call my bathroom metaphor. If two people live in an apartment in the two bathrooms, then both have freedom of the bathroom. You can go to the bathroom anytime you want, stay as long as you want for whatever you need, and everyone believes in freedom of the bathroom, it should be right there in the Constitution. <laughs> But if you have 20 people in the apartment and two bathrooms, then no matter how much every person believes in freedom of the bathroom, there's no such thing. You have to set up times for each person. You have to bang on the door, aren't you through yet? And so on. And Asimov concluded with what I think is one of the most profound observations I've seen in years. He says in the same way, democracy cannot survive over population. Human dignity cannot survive over population. Convenience and decency cannot survive over population. As you put more and more people into the world, the value of life not only declines, it disappears. It doesn't matter if someone dies. The more people there are, the less one individual matters. <coughs> and in the last one hour, the world population has increased by about 10,000 people, and the population of the United States has increased in this one hour by about 280 people. Now, except for the petroleum graphs, the things I tell you are not predictions of the future. I'm only reporting facts and the results of some very simple arithmetic. But I do this with confidence that these facts, these, this arithmetic, and more important, our level of understanding of them will play a major role in shaping our future. Now, don't take what I've said, blindly or uncritically, because of the rhetoric or for any other reason, please, you check the facts. Please check my arithmetic. If you find errors, please let me know. But if you don't find errors, then I hope you'll take this very, very seriously. Now, you are important people because you can think. This sets you aside from most of the people in this country, including people in high office. And so central to the things that we must do is to recognize that population <coughs> growth is the immediate cause of all of our resource and environmental crises. We should remember the words that we should remember that to be successful with this experiment of human life on Earth, we have to understand the laws of nature as we encounter them in the study of science and mathematics. We should remember the message of this cartoon that thinking is very upsetting it tells us things we'd rather not know. We should remember the philosophy of H.L. Mencken. He believed it was in the nature of the human species to reject what is true but unpleasant and to embrace what is obviously false but comforting. We should remember the words of Aldous Huxley that facts do not cease to exist because they are ignored. And we should remember the words of Galileo he said that I do not feel obliged to believe that the same God who has endowed us with sense, reason, and intellect has intended us to <laughs> forego their use. And so here is a challenge. Can you think of any problem, on any scale, from microscopic to global, 
whose long-term solution is in any demonstrable way aided, assisted, or advanced by having larger populations in our towns, our cities, our state, our nation, or on this earth. Can you think of anything that will get better by crowding more people into the earth? And I'll close with the words of the late Reverend Martin Luther King, Jr. He said, unlike the plagues of the Dark Ages, or contemporary diseases which we do not understand, the modern plague of overpopulation is soluble by means we have discovered and with resources we possess. What is lacking is not sufficient knowledge of the solution, but rather a universal consciousness of the gravity of the problem and the education of the billions who are its victims. And so I hope I made a reasonable case from my opening statement that I think the greatest shortcoming of the human race is our inability to understand this very simple arithmetic.